The Gormenghast Trilogy by Mervyn Peake Book One Titus Groan The Reveries The Reverie of Cora And it's so cold And it's so cold And it's so cold Hands and cold feet but nice ones. Mice are nicer than Clarice's, which she pricks with her embroidery. Clumsy thing. But hers are also cold, I hope. But I want Gertrude's to be colder than the ice in dreadful places. She's so fat and proud and far too big. And I desire her frozen with her stupid bosom. And when we're stronger in power, we will tell her so, Clarice and I, when he lets us with his cleverness, which is more clever than all the castle, and our thrones will make us regal, and our thrones will make us regal. But I'm the one to sit highest, and I wonder where he is, and stupid Gertrude thinks I'm frightened, and I am, but she doesn't know. And I wish she would die, and I'd see her big ugly body in a coffin, because I'm of the blood, and poor Sepulcrave looks different, which she's done to him, ugly woman, with fat bosom and carrots hair, the vegetable thing. So cold here, cold, so cold here. And my hands and feet, which is what Clarice is feeling like, I suppose. She's so slow compared with me. She looks so silly with her mouth open, not like me. She looks so silly with her mouth open. Not like My mouth isn't open. Yes, it is. I've left it open, but now I've shut it, and it's closed up, and my face must be perfect like I'll be when I get my power. Get my power. Get my and when the West Wing is raging with glory... Why was the fire so big when? I don't understand. And we are made to be in darkness. And one day, perhaps, I will banish Steerpike when he's done everything for us. And perhaps I won't, for it's not time to know yet. And I'll wait and see, because he isn't really of good stock like us, and ought to be a servant. But he's so clever, and sometimes treats me with reverence, which is due to me, of course, which is due to me, of course. For I'm Lady Cora of Gormenghast. I am. And there's only me and my sister who are like that, and she's not got the character I have, and must take advice from me. It is so cold. And Barquentine is so long and he is so nasty, but I will bow a little to him, not too much, but about an inch to show that he's done his work adequately, not well, but adequately, with his voice and his wooden crutch, which is so unnecessarily stupid to have, instead of a leg, and perhaps I'll look at it so that he sees me while I look just for a little moment to show him I am me, and he mustn't forget my blood. And what is poor Sepulcrave looking like that for, with his mouth slipping down on one side and upon the other while he looks at her, and she looks so frightened, poor stupid fuchsia, who is still too young to understand anything. Yet she never comes to visit us when she could be taught, but her cruel mother has turned her against us with her evil. But her cruel mother has turned her against us with her evil. I feel hungry. Nobody will pass me anything for the narrow squeaky. Doctor is asleep, or very nearly, and Swelter never notices, nor does anyone except the clever boy. There is a thud on the table beyond the doctor to her right. Reverie of Alfred Prune Squalor And although it is patent that he hasn't very long, I can't keep pumping Hydrophomoramis Chromatica of ash, of ash, of ash into him every five hours or so, and he'll need it even more frequently than that his mouth is slipping already, devil take it, which is too near the mark by all that gruesome it is. 
but the stuff will wipe him out unless I go easy. And what will happen, God knows, if the owl crops up again. But we, or rather I, must be prepared for anything and make tentative plans to meet contingencies, for the others have no responsibilities except for the ritual of the place, and never have had a case of this transference kind so unpleasantly actual. For though the depersonalization has set in for good, that is the lesser thing, for the hooting is outside the range of science. Yet what started the whole thing was the burning. What started the whole thing was the burning. Undoubtedly, oh yes, undoubtedly, for it was only melancholia up until then. But thanks and praise be to all the bottle gods and powder princes that I had the drugs, and that I guessed the strength well enough for the moment. But he must go back to bed immediately the breakfast is over and have someone in the room with him whenever I have to go for meals. But they might be brought to me in his room better still, and perhaps Fuchsia might do it, though the sight of her father might be too much for her. But we cannot tell yet, and must be careful, bless her dear heart, poor girl. She looks so mournful, and she is holding my finger so sadly, I would rather she gripped it desperately. It would be more symptomatic of an honest panic in her. I must comfort her if I can, though what in the name of tact can I say to calm an intelligent and sensitive child who has seen her father hooting from a mantelpiece? Hooting from a mantelpiece, hooting from a mantelpiece. But care must be taken, great care, and perhaps Irma will get a room ready for her in the house. But the next few hours will tell, and I must be on the alert, for the Countess is no help with her mind in the clouds. And Irma is, of course, Irma, and nothing but undiluted Irma for now and ever, and must be left where she is. And Steerpike remains, who is an enigma to me, and of whom I have doubts, very definitely, and in whose presence I find less and less amusement, and more and more a sense of evil which I can base upon no power of rational reasoning, save that he is obviously out for himself, out for himself, out for himself, and himself alone, but who isn't? And I will bear him in mind and dispense with him if I can. But a brain is a brain, and he has one, and it may be necessary to borrow it at short notice. But no, no, I will not by all that's instinctive. I will not, and that settles it. I'll handle whatever needs to be handled myself. Well, well, I don't remember quite such a strong presentiment in my old carcass for a long time. We must wait and see, and the waiting won't be long, and we'll hope the seeing won't be long either, for there is something very unhealthy about all this, by all that's bursting into flower in my April dell. There most undeniably is, and my languorous days seem to be over for the time being, but bless me, the gypsy girl is squeezing a bit harder, and what on earth is she staring at? His mouth is slipping, and it's coming on again, coming on again, coming on again. There is a thud on the table beside him. Reverie of Fuchsia. What can I do? Oh, what can I do? What can I do? Oh, what can I do? He is so ill and pale, like the thin face that he has got that is broken all alone. But he is better, better than he was. Oh, no, the sickness in me. No. Oh, I mustn't think of eyes. Oh, who will help me? Who will? Who will? Who will? You must look now, Fuchsia. Be brave. You must look, Fuchsia. Look now. He is better now, while he is here at table. He is quite close to me, my father, and so sad. Why does he smile? Oh, who will save him? Who will save me? Who will be the power to help us, father? Who will not let me be near and let me understand? Which I could, and he is better. Remember, he is better than... Oh, Fuchsia, be brave. 
for the roundness of his eyes is gone. Gone! But, oh no, I mustn't. Why were they round? Round and yellow, I don't understand. Oh, tell me, my trees, tell me, my trees and rocks, for Nanny won't know. Oh, Doctor dear, you must tell me, and I will ask you when we're alone. Oh, quick, quick, this horrible breakfast, quickly go. This horrible breakfast, quickly go. This horrible breakfast. And I will take care of him, for I understand, because the tower was there. The tower was over his long lines of books, his books, and its shadow fell across his library at morning. And its shadow fell across his library. Always, at morning. always, father dear, the tower of flints that the owls live in. Oh, no, I do not understand. But I know, dear father, let me comfort you, and you must never be like that again. Never, 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 and I will be your sentry for always, always your sentry, and will never talk to other people, never. Only you, my dear pale man, and none will come near you. Only perhaps the doctor, when you want him, but only when you do, and I will bring you flowers of every kind of colour and shape and speckled stones that look like frogs and ferns and all the beautiful things I can find, and I will find books for you and will read to you all day and all night and never let you know I'm tired, and we shall go for walks when you are better, and you will become happy, and you will become happy if happy. only you could be, if only... Sad, thin, broken face, so pale, and none else would be there. Not my mother any more. Not Steerpike, no. No, not him. He is too hard and clever, and not like you, who are more clever, but with kindness, and not quick with clever words. I can see his mouth, his mouth. Oh, Dr. Prune, quick, quick, the blackness, and he's going far away. And the voice, Dr. Prune, quick! The voice is going far away of... The voice is going far away of... The voice is Barquentine away. is going far away. I cannot see. No, no. Oh, black, my Dr. Prune. The black is swaying. 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 A darkness is closing its midnight curtains across her mind and the shapes before her of her mother, Nanny, Clarice, and the Earl recede into floating fragments, while like the echo of an echo the voice of Barquentine stammers on and on. Fuchsia cannot feel the doctor's finger any longer in her palm, except as an infinitely far away sensation, as though she were holding a thin tube of air. In a final wave the blackness descends once and for all, and her dark head, falling forward, strikes the table with a thud. Reverie of Irma Prune Squalor And I'd very much like to know what advantage I am getting out of having spent so long a time in the bath and preparing myself for them so exquisitely, exquisitely, exquisitely. for my swan-like throat is the most perfect one in Gormengast, but I wish my nose weren't quite so pointed. But it is velvet white like the rest of my skin, and it's a pity I wear spectacles with black lenses too, I suppose. But I am positive my skin is snow white, not only because I can see it dimly in the mirror when I take my spectacles off, although it hurts my eyes, but also because my writing paper is perfectly white when I've got my glasses on and look at my face and throat in the mirror, and then hold a piece of my white writing paper next to my face, I can see that my skin and the stationery are exactly the same tone of grey, and everything else in the mirror all around me is darker and very often black. But what's the use of writing paper with crinkle edges to me? For there's no one to write to us. They used to be when I was younger. Not that I was more attractive then, for after all, I am still a virgin. But there was Bogfron, 
who had so many beautiful adventures among the people he redeemed from sin, and he appreciated me, and wrote me three letters on tissue paper, although it was a pity that his nib pen used to go right through it so often, and make it difficult for me to read the passionate parts where he told me of his love. In fact, I couldn't read them at all, and when I wrote and asked him to try and remember them and write me a fourth letter just putting in only the passionate sentences which I couldn't read in the first three of his beautiful letters, he wouldn't answer me. And I think it was because I asked him in my last message to him to either write more carefully on the tissue paper or to use ordinary paper that he became shy Poor, silly, stupid, glamorous Mr. Spockfron, who I will always remember, but he hasn't been heard of since, and I am still a virgin. And who is there to make love to me tenderly, and to touch the tip of my snowy hands, and perhaps just a tiny touch on my hip bone, which juts out so magnificently, as Steerpike mentioned that evening, when Alfred was called away to get a fly out of that slag woman's eye, for Steerpike, bless the boy, has always been most observant, and I know how it broke my heart to see him so miserable on the day he left, and now I never see him, and it's a pity that he is not a little older and taller but once he speaks to me and fastens his eye on me in that respectful way he has, noticing the beauty of my skin and hair and the way my hips come out so excitingly, then I do not wish him any different, but feel a little queer and realize how impelling he is. For what is age anyway? But years and years are nothing if not silly and ridiculous man-made things which do not understand the way of delicate women with the years coming so unkindly. And how could there be so many in my case, all forty of them, that have never had their due? Or why I am unmarried I do not know when I take so much care over my cleanliness. But who is there? Who is there? Oh, my emptiness is all alone. Oh, my emptiness. And with Alfred, is all alone. who can be so silly, though he's really clever, but doesn't listen to me and falls asleep like he is doing now. And I wish he wouldn't keep looking at the Earl, who, after all, isn't someone to be stared at. Although there is something very strange about him tonight, and how chilly it is in this big and empty and horrible hall, which is so famous. But what use is it if we don't talk to each other, and there are no men to watch every gracious movement of my throat, and I will be glad to be back in my house again, where I will go on reading my book, and it won't be so cold, and perhaps I can write a note to Steerpike and ask him to supper. Yes, I will do that. Alfred said he won't be in tomorrow evening. Alfred said he won't be in tomorrow evening. Her thoughts are broken by a thud to her left. The Reverie of Lady Clarice Her thoughts have been identical with those of her sister in every way, save only in one respect, and this cleavage can best be appreciated by the simple process of substituting Cora's name for her own whenever it appears in the Reverie of the former. Reverie of Gertrude the Countess of Gormengast. At any rate, old Sourdust would have taken longer over his job than this one. At any rate, old Sourdust would have taken longer. And it won't be long before I can have my white cat, who is crying at my heart again. May the fiends rack the long servant's bones. And I've left enough water in the basin for the raven's bath and can see to the sandpiper's wing directly I get away from here, and my white cat is comforted. Yet the stupid man has about fourteen pages to get through. Yet, thank heaven, I don't have many of these things to attend, and there won't be another child if I know anything about it. But now here is the sun for Gormengast, which is what the castle needed, and when he is older I will teach him how to take care of himself and how to live his own life as far as it is possible, 
for one who will find the grey stones across his heart from day to day, for one who will find the grey stones across And the secret is to be able to freeze the outsider off completely, and then he will be able to live within himself, which Sepulcrave does in the wrong way. For what use are books to anyone whose days are like a rook's nest, with every twig a duty? And I shall teach the boy to whistle birds out of the sky to his wrist. And I shall teach the boy to whistle birds. Which I have never taught, Fuchsia, because I have kept my knowledge for the boy. And if I have the time before he is twelve years old, and if it's a pleasant evening, I might take him to the pool that is as green as my malachite ring with the silver setting and let him watch the lesser fly-spotted wag-catchers building their soft grey nests out of the moth wings and dew-twine. But how do I know he will be observant and careful with birds? For Fuchsia disappointed me before she was five with her clumsiness, for she used to ram the flowers into the glass vases and bruise the stalks, although she loved them. But it is my son I wish to teach, for there is no use in my revealing my secrets to a girl. But she will be so useless for a long time, for a long time, for a long time. And must be kept away from my room until he is about five at least, when he will be able to absorb what I tell him about the sky's birds and how he can keep his head quite clear of the duties he must perform day after day until he dies here as his fathers have done, and be buried in the sepulchre of the groans, and must learn the secret of silence, and must learn the secret of silence, and go his own way among the birds and the white cats and all the animals, so that he is not aware of men, but performs his legendary duties faithfully as his father has always done, whose library was burned away along with old sourdust. And how it started, I have very little idea. And how it started, I have very little idea. Except that the steer pike youth was very quickly upon the scene, and although he was the means of our escape, I do not like him, and never shall, and never shall, with his ridiculous little body and slimy manners. He must be sent away, for I have a feeling he will do harm. For I have a feeling he will do harm. And Fuchsia must not be with him, for she is not to mix with so cheap and ignoble a thing as that sharp youth. She converses too often with Prune Squalor, Prune with Squalor. whom I saw her talking twice last month, for he is not of the blood, not of the blood, not of and the blood. And as for the murderous and devilish Flay, who has hurt my poor defenceless cat so much that all the other white glories will be uneasy through the black hours of night, black hours of night. Black hours of and night. feel the pains which he feels as he is curled in my arms. For Flay has broken himself with his ghastly folly, and shall be banished, whatever Sepulcrave may say, whose face has changed tonight, and has been changed on the three occasions on which I have seen him since the burning of his books. And I will tell the doctor to attend him constantly. For I have a presentiment of his death. For I have a presentiment. And it of is his good death. that Titus is born. For the line of the groans must never be broken through me. And there must be no ending at all. And no ending. And I shall tell him of his heritage and honour. And how to keep his head above the interwoven nest. And watch the seasons move by. And the sounds of the feathered throats. Feathered throats, feathered throats, feathered throats. A thud upon the table immediately opposite her causes the Countess to lift her eyes slowly from the tablecloth. Reverie of Nanny Slag Yes, yes, yes. It's all so big and wonderful, I suppose it is. Oh, my poor heart. This lovely rich breakfast which nobody eats. 
and the little precious boy in the middle of the cutlery, bless his little heart, for he hasn't cried once, not once, the tiny morsel, with everybody around him too, and thinking about him, for it's his breakfast, my pretty precious, and Nanny will tell you all about it when you're a big boy. Oh, my poor heart, how old I'll be by then, and how cold it is. A good thing I wrapped the little boy in his wrap, which is under all the lilac windings, yes, 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 yes. And he mustn't sneeze, oh no, but be still. I am so cold and his great heavy mother beside me, so that I feel I don't matter at all. And I suppose I don't matter at all, for nobody takes any notice of me. And nobody loves me, and nobody loves me, except my darling caution. But even she sometimes forgets, but not the others who never think of me except when they want me to do something for them, for I have to do everything. And oh, my poor heart, I'm not young any more, and strong, and I get tired. And even Fuchsia never remembers how tired I get. Even now I'm tired for having to sit so long in the cold. So far beneath the huge countess who doesn't even look at her little boy, who's being so good, and I don't think she could ever love him like I love him. But oh, my poor heart, it's a good thing the countess can't hear me thinking about her like this, though sometimes I think she can tell when I think against her, because she's so silent, and when she looks at me, I don't know what to do, or where to go and I feel so little and weak, and I feel like that now. But how cold it is! How cold it is! How cold And I'd rather have my own simple kind of breakfast by the fire in my own small room that look out than look at all this food on the table getting cold. Although it's all here for the little boy, bless him, and I will look after him as long as I have any strength in my poor bones, and make him a good boy, and teach Fuchsia to take care of him, and she is loving him more than ever she did before, though she doesn't like to hold him like I do, and I am glad, because she might drop him the clumsy caution. And oh, my poor heart, if he should ever fall and be killed. Oh, no, no, never. Oh, no, no, never. She must never hold him, for she is so ignorant of how to be careful of a little baby. For she is so ignorant of how to be careful of a little baby, she doesn't look at him now in the middle of the table any more than her mother or any of the others do but just stares at her father with her naughty dark face. So sad. What can it be for? She must tell me, and tell me everything, leaving nothing out about why she looks so mournful, the silly girl who can have no trouble at her age, and hasn't got all the work to do, and the trials which I have on my old shoulders all the time. And it is silly for her to be so sad when she is only a child and doesn't know anything. Bless her. Bless her. Bless her. Nanny is startled by a thud upon the table, nearly opposite her. Reverie of Sepulcrave, 76th Earl of Gormengast. And the lights will be stifled away, and the noises of my mind strangled among the thick, soft plumes which deaden all my thoughts in a shroud of numberless feathers. For they have been there so long, and so long in the cold, hollow throat of the tower, and they will be there for ever. For there can be no ending to the owls whose child I am to the great owls, whose infant and disciple I shall be, so that I am forgetting all things, and will be taken into the immemorial darkness far away among the shadows of the groans, and my heartache will be no more, and my heartache will be no more, and my dreams and thoughts no more, and even memory will be no longer, so that my volumes will die away from me, and the poets be gone, for I know the great tower stood above my cognitations day and night through all the hours, and they will all go, the great writers, and all that lay between the fingered covers, all that slept 
or walked between the vellum lids where for the centuries they haunted, and no longer are, and no longer are, and no longer And my remorse is over now and for ever, for desire and dream has gone, and I am complete, and longing only for the talons of the tower, and the suddenness and clangour among the plumes, and an end and a death, and the sweet oblivion. For the last tides are mounting momentally, and my throat is growing taut and round, round like the Tower of Flints, and my fingers curl, and I crave the dusk and sharpness like a needle in the velvet, and I shall be claimed by the powers, and the fretting ended, 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 ended. And in my annihilation there shall be a consummation, for he has come into the long line and is moving forward, and the long dead branch of the groans has broken into the bright leaf of Titus, who is the fruit of me, and there shall be no ending, and the grey stones will stand for always, and the grey stones will stand for always. And the high towers for always, where the rain drifts weave. And the laws of my own people will go on forever, while among my great dusk haunters in the tower, my ghost shall hover. My ghost shall hover. And my bloodstream ebb forever. And the striding fever over who are these, and these so far from me. And yet so vast, and so remote and vast, my future, dusky daughter, bring me branches and a field mouse from an acre of grey pastures. Grey pastures. Grey pastures. Grey pastures.